Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on when you're watching this lecture. This is our lecture 4 for 122 class. Uh, in this lecture I'm going to talk about template functions, pointers, and classes. Class is a little bit more deeper look. <clears throat> you know, from the sound of it, you must be thinking I, you know, I either either made this lecture all like all the lectures all at once because I sound sick in most of them, um, or I've just been sick um, uh, more often. It's like it's a letter though. I apologize. <laughs> I, I have nothing to do in getting sick, um, but I'll do my best. I've got my caffeine here next to me. I'll kick in. Okay, so functions, I, you know, we did talk about functions, but this one is slightly different. Template functions, what are those? These are, think of it as a generic function. The definition of function template is there are special functions that can operate with generic types. This allows us to create a function template whose functionality can be adapted to more than one type or class without repeating the entire code. Now, let's say, for example, you want to use a template with a class. Right? So it's going to take in a class or parameters of a class, etc. But you don't know anything about the class, right? The class is a class containing ints, longs, floats, whatever the data type is, or is a custom-made class. But what you do want to do is the meat or is the logic of the function, you want to keep it intact. And you want to be able to use it in different places. All right, I mean, I don't know. At some point, you'll run into lambdas and... Um, can you use template functions with Lambda? Think about it when you're using Lambda. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it is a very useful concept. Uh, so you, you reuse the logic again and again by giving it different types of parameters, different types of classes. Sounds pretty cool, right? It definitely is. Um, the way you go about declaring it is you say template, class identifier, and then the function declaration. Or you say template, type name, identifier, function declaration. That's the generic way of uh, going about it. So here is an example of a method called get max. Okay, it takes takes in takes in the generic class, right? and my type A, my type B, and those are two different classes. And then it returns. So what that is, it's a fancy way of saying check if A is greater than B. If yes, then A, otherwise B. Right. So. If A is greater than B, it's going to return A. Otherwise, it's going to return B. Let me show a live example of this. Oops. So here I've got a template, class T, and, and a function that is get max. Okay? T is, it, like, T is a generic type, right? We don't know what T is right now. Uh, when we start running the code, executing it, that's when we're going to find out about it. So, you've got template, class T. Okay. Um, T result, you've got a placeholder of a generic type, once again. And then the result is, if A is greater than B, that's what you're checking. If A is greater than B, then result is equal to A. Otherwise, it's B. And you're going to return the result. Now, the generic... Um, uh, the generic way of declaring it uh, might sound confusing to you, um, but it is fairly straightforward once you look at this example. Now, I've got a main, uh, I've got a driver method, right, main function. I've got two, I've got ints in there, and I've got longs in there. Now, it, all of them have to be the same type, right? You can't mix and match. So, I've got int i equal to 5, j equal to 6, and then k, which is, uninitialized and then I've got three longs one of them is uninitialized uh, L is 10 M is 5 and third one is uninitialized now for both of them I call get max now the class right get this class in there is, is generic so instead of a class I send an integer or long so what it says is I'm using with type integer so the parameters are going to be integer Everything's going to be integer. So you call get max with an integer, and you're going to get uh, max out of it, right? Um, and the same thing goes for long. Same data type, right? You've got longs in here. So you say get max long. So you, def you, you give it, you tell it what can it expect. It can expect all longs. Now, when you run the program, first one is six. 
right, between 5 and 6. 6 is greater. L and M, 10 and 5, 10 is greater. It's as simple as that, right? So try this out with a few examples and uh, then it's going to make sense. Recursion, a fancy name, but a simple concept. Simple after you understand it. Uh, the process in which a function calls itself directly or indirectly is called recursion. And the function that does it is called a recursive function. Now, the example that I'm going to show you is a direct uh, recursion. You know, the definition talks about indirect, but mostly the way I've used it is, uh, is directly. And then using a recursive algorithm, <clears throat> certain problems can be solved quite easily now so simply put it a function that calls itself again and then again and again well you're thinking well isn't that going to be infinite no you are going to have some sort of an exit condition that the last copy of the function that gets called how do you come back to the very first one um, so this is what the syntax might look like you have a, a function called recurse Okay, the recurse call recurse. It's going to call itself. So the main function is going to call recurse, and then that function ends up calling itself. So the way it looks like is when this one is called, the control of the program goes here, right? And then when you're in it, that method calls itself. It's, uh, it's as simple as that. This is a direct recursion. Uh, one of the famous example, famous example that exists up until this day is the factorial example. Uh, what is factorial? 6 factorial is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 1 factorial is 1. 2 factorial is 2 times 1. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. Right? So in it, um, we're going to have, we're going to call... Uh, with the number four okay and how does that work when you say result is factorial n and in the factorial method we say if n is greater than one okay then you return n times factorial n minus one otherwise you return one now the return one is actually uh, the exit condition um, of this recursion. Now, what's going to happen? Just follow this logic. So, 4 is still greater than 1. So, what, what's going to happen is n is 4. I'm going to do 4 times factorial n minus 1. Then I end up calling factorial 3. Okay, so there's another copy right here. So, I'm in 3. Is 3 greater than 1? Yes. So, then I call 3 times factorial n minus 1, which is 2. Okay, let me go again. Is 2 greater than 1? Then you call 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 1. Aha, so now you're finally at this 1. Is 1 greater than 1? No, return 1. So 1 comes here. All right, so you end up doing 2 times 1, which is 2. You go here, all right, so 3 times 2, right, because you get the result 2 here. So 3 times 2 is 6, and that 6 goes here, right? 6 times 4 is 24, that goes here. So that is the final result. That's, you, that's how you go about dealing with factorial. I have an example here. And that example is that of factorial. So I take it, in that example, I showed you um, four, right? Four factorial. What if I ask the user uh, for a number? So I say five. But you get the point though. This is the same factorial method that's used, except what I'm doing here is I'm asking the user for an input.
and that input I'm saying it's got to be non negative, right? And then I call the factorial method and finally I end up getting the result that I want. Now it, it all sounds great, fine, and dandy. But let's talk about uh, the pros and cons. Obviously, we're going to talk about the pros first. It makes the court, yeah, it makes the code very short and clean. I mean, the factorial, you know, instead of doing if, then else, or right, repeating bunch of lines of code over and over and over again, you get away with less lines of code, and it's cleaner. And recursion is required in problems concerning data structures and advanced algorithms such as graph and tree traversal. We haven't talked about trees yet, but something to keep in mind, that recursion really helps in uh, going through the nose of a tree. Red, black tree, binary tree, uh, whatever, you know. So we're convinced of recursion, but there are some disadvantages too, right? It takes a lot of stack space compared to an iterative program. So it's going to consume up memory because it's going to have all these copies of, uh, of the program in there. It uses more processor speed and it can be difficult to debug compared to a iterative program, right? Because you got to mentally, you got to have this picture or draw it out or however you're going to debug it. It is going to take time. Uh, but I think the advantage is uh, outweigh the disadvantages and up until this day I use recursion so next up we have um, a sort function uh, the standard template library which is the library that's included in C++ comes with a um, might have mentioned this before um, a whole bunch of um, you know you can use vectors from their data structures from their and built-in methods uh, one of the key ones in, is sort uh, the book also talks about binary search. Um, you know, there's a binary search tree. Uh, there's a binary search. You know, what I would do is towards the end of this, um, end of the class, we are going to get into data structures. And I think at that point, I'm going to cover binary search. Uh, so I'll keep that aside for now. Uh, the other two things I'm keeping aside is the declaration of the array. You guys should know this already. And then there's a multi-dimensional array. The most you might want to play around with in terms of example is a two-dimensional array. You know, although I don't intend to test you guys on multi-dimensional array because I myself don't use it that much. Uh, you know, I've seen some questions and when I used to study it, but, you know, the problem with these multi-dimensional arrays is you, you should know how it works and how to implement it. But you don't really need a deep understanding. Uh, I'll pause there. I just know how it works. I'm not going to test you on it. Um, so that's why I'm keeping that also aside. But the sort method is a very, very important one. That's why I'm going to cover it. So sort can sort the, uh, it's a vector on the array, right? Vector, you guys might know this. It's a built-in, um, it's a built-in data structure. Uh, that STL provides for you. Uh, an array, you guys know what an array is, uh, and a vector is simply a uh, dynamic sized array. Uh, the sort method takes in two parameters. One, the first one's uh, the beginning, and the second one is at the end, the one, beginning and the end, right? So you want to take the start and end. Uh, the third, uh, third one is an optional, like if you want to sort them in alphabetical order. Um, if you don't specify an order, um, by default, sort's going to uh, order everything in um, ascending order. Uh, there's a way to do it in descending order, uh, which I'm going to show you, uh, but let's see. Uh, let's jump right into it. So here, I've declared an array, 1, 5, 8. I've initialized the array. Uh, N is the size of the array. Size of is a built-in method. Uh, so I'm saying n is uh, size of array divided by size of array at zero. Um, that's how you get the n. Now sort, right, the, the, this example, I'm only showing you two parameters. So I start off at the array, and I go array plus one. 
right? The beginning of the array and the length of n. So we want to go up until the length of the array. Um, see how much how much further we get, right? Um, this one is not going to be intuitive. Uh, so just understand, uh, just know the syntax right for now. Uh, it's become it's going to become intuitive, and from the sort method, the beginning and the end. That's what you ought to keep in mind. Now let's run this and see what happens. Uh, include messages. See, after sorting it in the beginning of one, five, eight, nine, six, seven, three, four, all over the place. Now, after sorting it, um, you know, you can even um, write a method yourself that's going to do the sorting for you. Uh, you know, in data structures class 216, you're going to learn more about, um, I think, bubble sort, merge sort, uh, the runtime algorithm, etc. But the runtime, we're not going to get into that uh, right now. But as built in functionality is great if you want to use sort. Um, and what did we say? By default, it's ascending order. So get an example for descending. Um, similar, right? It's the same array. And this is not intuitive right now. I get it. Uh, the start and the end of the array, but there is a method called greater that you can use. Uh, if you pass this, you're going to get it in descending order. And this is uh, a generic one, right? So in these uh, braces, the type is going to go. If you had a uh, a double, right? So if you had an array of double, you'd put in double. A long, you'll put in long, etc. You get the point, right? So now let's go ahead and run it. There you go, right? It's descending order. So by default, it's ascending, but if you want to do it descending, you pass in greater than and then the type. And open and close parentheses. Uh, now, one thing I don't know if you guys picked up on it is sort takes in two parameters, right? The beginning and the end. But what we can also do with those two parameters is you can give it a beginning and the end. That's kind of from the middle of the array. Doesn't really have to be from the uh, from the start of the array, right? So in this case, it's array plus two, so two elements after the first one, and then array plus n. It ends all the way uh, at the last element. Let's see what happens. Zero, one. Zero, one stays as it is. You know what I should do is to make this clear. Let's oh, let's run this. So I started two elements at, out. So I started from this num, uh, this third element, and then I sorted it all the way to the end. Now see what happens to the first two elements. They're left out as it is, right? Because I gave it a different beginning. This should be intuitive. So you can say, the first four should be left untouched, right? 10, 15, 5, 8, and then it's going to sort the rest of it. Okay. Hopefully at that point is clear. Okay, so now we're on to an advanced topic. I'm definitely not going to make this trivial um, or say it's easy because it's not. Uh, it's a advanced topic, fairly complicated, but very useful. Um, it's going to be complicated in the beginning, but once you get the hang of it, uh, just like anything else, it's going to be straightforward for you. Pointers. Pointers are symbolic representation of addresses. So pointers simply, as the as the word suggests, they point to a address. Everything in memory uh, that you store of, let's say you have a variable, right? You've declared a variable, you store it, but what happens with it? Uh, that particular variable has an address in the memory where it's stored, right? It's got to be stored somewhere. 
and the memory address is and the way you get access to that memory address is via pointer. Uh, they enable programs to simulate call by reference. You know, there is this concept that I might have mentioned before, call by call by value and call by reference. Right? So if you call by reference, what happens is, and if you change something uh, in that method, right, and it's called by reference, the original value actually changes. And the way you go about it is by using pointers. And the way you declare it, you say data type, uh, this uh, asterisk, and the variable name. So let's say you have an int pointer. Pointer can point to an address uh, which is holding an integer, right? So behind the scenes, um, it's a uh, address holder. Let's see how the pointer works in C++. So let's say you have this variable, int, it should be lowercase i. It's a typo. Int var equal to 10. Now, you declare a pointer. Int asterisk ptr equals to the address of var. Right? Keep this in mind is you got to use this ampersand. Ampersand or var. Uh, and then you say asterisk ptr equal to 20. Well, what happens here? Um, so when you say ptr equals 20, it cancels this and puts a 20 in there. Pointer to a pointer. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'll come back to it later maybe. Uh, let's, let's just focus on... Uh, a single pointer, right? Um, how do you go about using a pointer? You define a pointer, you assign the address of a variable to a pointer using that ampersand, right? That I just showed you, which returns the address to the variable, just in the previous line, right? So you say pointer equals to ampersand bar. Uh, and then accessing the value stored, you say, you put this asterisk again. Right, just like how we did. Asterisk at pointer equal to 20, that's going to change the value. Uh, let's run through some examples here. Now, I include a library. I'm not going to go into the details of the library, but I've included this library that I'm going to be using. Um, I've got a method called pointers. Right, it returns void. Uh, a var equal to 20, I declare an int pointer, right? So what's going to happen at this point? My pointer is pointing to a memory address, and that address is used to store an integer. PTR equals to ampersand var. So at this point, pointer is pointing to the same thing as var. I say value at PTR, I just say PTR, what is it output? Value of var should be 20. Now value at, PT, at PTR, or with an asterisk, what is it going to give me? You go ahead and run it, you probably saw the output right there. Right? If I just say PTR, what is PTR? I mean, it's just a um, memory address, right? So this is the memory address right here. That's a memory address of where variable is stored, the var is stored. All right, and then star or asterisk PTR and var, they're both 20. So that's how you access the element or the contents of it, right? So this example is there to illustrate how how you get used to the syntax ampersand asterisk those two things keep in mind when you declare it oh, let me try this is it going to be the same or is it going to be different it's going to be the same doesn't really matter right I mean you could say how about this one? 
And so between instar and in space star, it would have been different. No, it's not. So, but, but the way you declare it is it's an end pointer, and the name of it is PTR. And PTR is assigned M percent M Y. Right. Uh, the one thing. Watch. Let's see. see, both of these are the same. That is because it's same memory address, right? M percent of bar and pointer. Pointer's got a. It's a pointer to a, a memory address. Right, I'm percent of R is that. Thought I'll point that out. And in my main, all I do is I, I, I call the method pointers. Uh, next example, there are different ways to pass pointer. You can pass, you can call by value, by reference, and then call by so there is call by value call by reference which you might have heard before but then there is call by reference with a reference argument what does that mean i don't think that's going to be intuitive uh, i'll walk through the example and and i think once you do another bunch of examples you know it's going to make sense but for now let's let's try to get these two concepts down So, uh, I've got a square one method, um, and then I'll put the ampersand and n, right? So it, it takes in an integer, and it puts the I'll put the uh, memory address, and then it says n star equals n. What is it doing here? It's a mod. It's clone modified inside the function and then you return n well that's pass by value pass by reference the reference see the difference here in syntax if it's by value you don't have a star or an ampersand in here you actually have a star so the address of n2 square 2 and n what are they going to be and then look at this explicitly dereferencing to get value pointed to it's this the syntax i'm not going to like it's complicated i don't think you're going to get it either and then you have pass by a reference for the reference argument so the difference here is um, instead of a star, you've got an ampersand here. And then you check the, um, what is at ampersand n. And then you do this dereferencing. You see the dereferencing we did up there? It's the same. Well, not quite the same. There is a difference, right? Here we've got a pointer. Oh, yeah. I think that first one, yeah, the first one and the last one are the same. Sorry. See, I might still get confused. Um, it's no easy way to explain this, honestly. But let's run through this example. Square is 64. The square is the same in all the three, right? But let's go through this. Square one. How did I call it? So I, I have an integer. N1. Right? And ampersand N1 is going to be that memory address. Square of M1. Square one N1. No change in N1. So what is it printing here? Let's look at what square one is doing. Ampersand n and n. Both of them gotta be the same. Why? Because of the memory address. Right, remember? 
the ampersand gets you the memory address. That's why it's saved. And then, uh, so, address is this one, and then clone modify. So you're modifying it inside the function itself. What's going to happen? N equals to N times N. It's as simple as that, right? To so multiply N by N, what did you get? What did you send in? 8. 8 times 8 is 64, so you return N. So that's what you get. Word two. Call by reference. So I say n two is eight. Address of n two in main. And then I call square two, and ampersand n two. Square of n two is this one. So maybe what I should really do is let's do it one by one. Um, let's do this. That's going to be a little bit easier. So, and, and we kind of walked through this already. So, it's... Serious. Because as I'm... As I'm talking about it, it seems that it's getting more and more harder to explain. So, okay. So, all I've got is, what do I have here? I've got call by value. Right? And we talked about this. Ampersand and N1 is the address. Square of N1, address of N1 and square is this. And then no change in N1. Right? It's called by value, so nothing got changed. Now, what's happening? Now we're doing call by reference. N2 is 8. And percent at N2? And see, the address stays the same, right? And then you call it with that ampersand n2. So you're given that memory address right there. And the square of n2 is 64. Oh, what happened to n2? This time, its value changed. Why? Because you gave it that memory address. So call by value, call by reference. The reference, you know what's going to happen now. The actual contents of n are going to get changed. So now let's go to that slightly more complicated call by reference with the reference, with the reference argument. What did you do here? So you had N3, and then you say address of N3 is this, and then you send an N3. And then you say, okay, what happened to N3? square of n3 but in the actual method what are you doing you take in an ampersand right so it's it's by reference you get an ampersand n and then you say ampersand n and you know this let's what it is, it's just a short way of saying n equals n times n. So what happens here? In this case too, the actual n3 got changed. The third type is, like I said, it's confusing. 
you have to pay too much attention to it, but the call by value and call by reference is something that you should understand. Um, where, where are we at? Ah, pointer arithmetic. You can increment the pointer, you can decrement a pointer, you can add an integer to a pointer, you can subtract one, and then you can see the difference between the two. Basically, you're doing mathematical operation. So since it's a memory address, you can pretty much do anything, right? You can add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever you want to do. But uh, these operations, increment, decrement, you'll see more often. You might subtract the two pointers at some point. Uh, uh, but you can add it to a pointer, subtract it. But all of these are going to make sense in the concept of an array. So let's go through this example and see how much of it of it is making sense. I've got a um, an array of three uh, integers, right? 5, 10, and 20. And then I've got an integer pointer. I'm going to make it point to val. I'm going to make it point to an array. And then the elements of the array, pt at 0, pt at 1, pt at 2. Right? So you could have done val at 0, val at 1, val at 2. And though the way you access the pointer and, and, and the array are, are, are very similar. Okay, I'm going to stop right here and then we'll pick it up in the next, next lecture.